You're listening to World Affairs, produced in partnership with KQED. I'm Teresa Katsourilis. So as Iran's dry summer dragged on, the country's water shortages fueled deadly protests. People here are demonstrating against severe water shortages in one of Iran's hottest regions. Iranian security forces have killed at least eight demonstrators in cities across the country. There have been also strikes by farmers here and there, sometimes attacks to water transfer pipes and and strikes against water transfer projects. But the latest water protests in Iran were unprecedented. Kavi Madani is an environmental scientist with posts at Yale University and London's Imperial College. He's been studying Iran's water systems for years, and his diagnosis is grim. The Iranian water system is bankrupt. Madani spent a lot of time thinking about Iran's water woes. And a few years ago, he was given a chance to help fix Iran's system himself. It didn't turn out exactly as he'd hoped. Ray Suarez picks up the story from here. In 2017, Kave Madani was living in London, and he received an offer from Tehran that he couldn't refuse. The Rouhani government wanted him to move back to his home country and become Iran's deputy head of the Department of Environment. It was a senior cabinet position, and it would mean giving up the comfortable life Madani had built abroad. Madani hadn't lived in Iran since he was 22, but he didn't hesitate. I took it just to um, see if my generation, the children of the Islamic Revolution, born after 1979, have a chance to have a positive impact on the country. I knew that it would be tough. I I told the vice president when he offered me the position, I said, go figure out if I get approved by the system because I don't want to end up in jail. And this was only sarcasm. It was a joke. So he gave up a tenured position at London's Imperial College and flew to Tehran. And at the passport control gate, I got arrested by the Islamic Revolutionary Guards of, of Iran. They, they had a, a, you know, a question which seems easy, but it's very hard to answer. Why would you come back? Why would you leave your good life in London and come back? Who would do that? We have the issue of brain drain. So how come someone after uh, 14 years is willing to come back and leave everything behind and all that? And they thought that someone else is writing a check for me. I might be an agent working with, for someone and I want to infiltrate the system and misguide them. And so this group arrested me. And then a few hours later, the other group rescued me. Madani says the officials who rescued him belong to the intelligence unit of Iran's civilian government. Iran's government is comprised of both democratically elected officials and a permanent cleric class, and those factions can be fiercely divided. There was a fight between the intelligence unit of the civilian government and the intelligence unit of the IRGC. You know, imagine um, if there is a fight between CIA and FBI over someone. Um, So the game started and I had to function in the middle of that game. Ultimately, Madani was released by the IRGC and allowed to assume his position with Iran's Department of Environment. To understand why the Revolutionary Guard arrested Madani at the airport in the first place, you have to understand the gravity of Iran's water crisis and why the Iranian government hasn't fixed it. So surface water, or the water which comes from the skies, uh, is our checking account. It's like our salary. The account gets refilled every month. And once we're out of our checking account, we go after our saving account. And our saving account is groundwater. And, and dry areas rely significantly on groundwater, Texas, California, Iran. And you can exhaust those as well. And what Iran has done is withdrawing groundwater at a rate which is much higher than the renewal rate. So the the saving account is also now empty. Iran is suffering at the same time from deforestation, desertification, land subsidence, um, sand and dust storms, wet, drying wetlands, drying rivers, biodiversity loss, air pollution, soil pollution, wildfires, f- floods, drought. So all the problems that you can name are there. Can you manage your way out of this? Iran is getting hotter and drier. 
Uh, you know, we read stories all the time of New York trying to uh, make itself uh, a harder target so that rising water doesn't rush into the subways or the tunnels. We read about um, Bangladesh trying to stop erosion from the big river delta, losing land to rising waters. You can adapt to too much water, it sounds like, but adapting to too little seems a lot harder, is it? Too much water... Too little water, they look different they, in terms of impact. And when there's too much water, not only you you lose like you know farmlands and and crops, but but then the the urban settlers, the you know the ordinary people get affected. But the big changes must come at the government level, and the government doesn't seem to be willing to take those actions because they have so many other pressing problems, and governments like around you know everywhere in the world have limited. Um, time and anything you want to do for the environment has immediate cost. You have to raise taxes, change prices, cut water. People don't appreciate it right away. And, and most politicians don't want to implement those changes. In Iran, Madani says, this kind of painful reform would involve restructuring the country's agricultural sector and diversifying its economy. As the new deputy head of Iran's Environment Department, he was particularly critical of Iran's dam building and cloud seeding initiatives. And he knew he was pushing for policies that weren't popular with everyone. A lot of things that you say as a scientist might contradict or not be in compliance with the slogans of the Islamic Republic or any system which is run um, by ideology, whether it's Taliban, whether it's the Islamic Republic of Iran, or whether it's the system run by Donald Trump. As long as ideology is prioritized over science and facts and knowledge, it, it's really hard to really take actions in the policy world. But, you know, I also was there to fight. I went there to do what I could. There were people who were willing to listen. I mean, that is why they tried to appoint me. I mean, the process of appointing me was not easy either. So someone had decided to do that. Within the circles of the government, there were people who were listening to me. There were people who were hearing me. There were people who were approving what I was saying. They wanted to do something. And in the short amount of time, we accomplished a lot, I would say, within that system, with system which is suffering from the lack of financial resources, from uh, a lack of a real political will to drive a change and lots of other things. I did a lot of things with people. I did a lot of campaigns with activists, with celebrities inside the country. The level of environmental activism and environmental awareness in, in Iran is very high compared to the rest of the region. So the Iranians experienced the late Lake Rumia tragedy, a, a big salt lake in northwest Iran, which dried up because water inflows to it were, were limited for agricultural purposes mainly. So after that, actually, which was a turning point in Iran's modern environmental history, in my opinion, Iranians have been very vocal about the environment, the general public and, and the activists and scientists. So the issue of expressing concerns about the environment is not new in Iran. You describe conflict as you arrive in Iran and conflict about appointing you at all. Did that conflict go on as you started to do your work? You were eventually called a bioterrorist, a spy. Were the knives out for you even after you became the deputy chief of the Department of Environment? Yes, they were, and they're still out there. They called me a water terrorist, arguing that I, I tried to shut down the agricultural sector so people lose jobs and migrate to cities, and I create another ISIS in the region. Even though if people had read my articles, if they had seen my interviews, I always said that Iran cannot shut down its agricultural se sector, and it must not do so. Um, whenever there is a blackout in Iran, for example, they blame me for my efforts to ratify the Paris Agreement in the parliament. Um, why? Because they believe that the Paris Agreement is imposing limits on development in Iran, and, and Iran cannot have natural gas-run power plants, and, and that is why we are getting blackouts. So conspiracy theories all over the place still 
out there. And that is telling us something else, that, that it doesn't really matter what you write in your papers, what you say and what is in, inside your brain. If you're functioning in a system where the media is against you, where the fake news is, is real, then you are in, in serious trouble because people don't go and read the papers that we write. And, and that was scary and that is still scary. De debunking all those stories is very hard when you're fighting with establishment, with money, gun, power, everything. I was also having a sympathy for the system. As a game theorist, I train my students actually to find the good reasons behind every bad decision. Um, so I, I always try to put myself in their shoes and think, you know, what are they thinking? What are their concerns? And try to address every concern. Like an example is, you know, the West is talking about climate change and, and water shortage and environmental problems in Iran. But the West also is imposing sanctions on us and they want us paralyzed and dead and all that. Like, how come they all of a sudden care about the environment? How would you answer that question? Um, how would you answer the question of why is the country which is giving funding for environmental stuff in Iran is at the same time blocking any sort of financial aid to Iran by the international agencies or blocking the oil income and, and so many other things? And their question is, how come all of a sudden the Westerners are so interested in Iran's environment. And these are very hard questions to answer in, in, in an interrogation when the other party on the other side is thinking that you're an agent, you're working for CIA, you're working for Mossad, you're working for MI6, and you have come back to destroy the country. And you are a person who, who looks different. You don't even have facial hair. You are that Western-educated person. What if? you are an agent. And I, I don't know, like, what if I'm still an agent? But the, the, honestly, this is also hard when the system doesn't believe in you and they can't do their due diligence, they can't verify where you are coming from. They're afraid of you. I, I try to have sympathy for this. I try to be a representative of my generation and try as hard as I could there are fights internally, domestically among political groups, and there is a fight between Iran and the West, and ordinary people get, they get caught in the middle. Iran's hardliners crack down on environmental activists and experts. First, a group of Iranian conservationists from the Persian Wildlife Heritage Foundation were charged with espionage after advocating for endangered Asiatic cheetahs. They got jailed, and then in, in February 2018, one of them found dead in his cell in, in prison. Um, the rest are still in jail. Just one has been uh, released. Madani ran afoul of the government's conservative wing only a month later. Eventually, in March 2018, th there was a moment for a big decision. Madani had been on a diplomatic mission in Thailand and was on his way home. As luck would have it, he had missed his direct flight from Bangkok to Tehran and had to book a new one with a layover in Istanbul. When I was on the flight from Bangkok to Istanbul, I was uh, online actually during the flight uh, uh, on the internet and I realized that some of my old photos from a conference in California, some of these photos are being released and the photos were nothing crazy <laughs> according to the Western standards, a um, bunch of nerds <laughs> and scientists uh, dancing or sitting at a table like dinner table where wine is being served so wine glasses are in front of people. He realized this meant one thing, Iran's hardliners were closing in on him. They hacked into all my social media accounts, everything I had, and they got access to 14 years of my email, like all my life abroad. And I knew that they're leaking the photos and they have incentives. I knew what's, what was going to happen to me. This was a point that, you know, their theories about me being a spy or traitor had not worked. Um, they presented another case that I'm not Muslim enough or I, I don't fit the Islamic Republic criteria. He says he would have been jailed if he'd landed in Tehran. Who knows what could have happened to me. So I didn't board my flight to Tehran and then went into hiding and, and resigned while I was in exile. Today, Madani is watching his country's water crisis intensify from a distance. He lives in North America, which is also struggling with historic droughts. Are there similarities between what Iran is facing 
and the water crises of the Western United States. Uh, this is a California-based program. The Colorado River doesn't even reach the Gulf of California anymore. The water rights holders take out every gallon that they can. Uh, there are places that have been farmed for a long time that no longer can water their crops. What can the rest of us learn from Iran's experience and, frankly, from your experience? <laughs> um, lots of similarities. I mean, no wonder Iranians love California. <laughs> Why we have Tehranjalas in Southern California. So climates, changes in elevation, changes in precipitation levels, precipitation in some places, some places dry. Also in California, like 80% of the water goes to the agricultural sector. In Iran, is about 90%. So lots of similarities between Iran and California. Now, Iran, the Persians lived in that part of the world for thousands of years. They needed water. And they had this old system of groundwater withdrawal called canots. Then it came the era of modernization. Dams were built in the United States. Hoover Dam, for example, had a massive impact on the rest of the world and it ignited actually a hydraulic um, revolution and it started a hydraulic mission around the world that we have to use engineering talent and control any water that we have access to. So what did the Californians do? For example, they built a lot of dams. You have a combination of of Dams and, and water transfer projects in, in California, same thing happened in Iran. You also have digging wells. Like before building dams, we got pumps and started digging wells. Iranians did the same. As soon as they started digging wells, there was a competition among the farmers who were cooperating with each other before. They had traditional management systems. They were working together. Now you have the Western model, which doesn't match the culture of the system, and you haven't thought about the social dimension of problems because we engineers don't do that. What happens is it's kind of a tragedy of the commons. At the end, everyone loses together because then the wetlands dry up. The sand and dust storms start coming up. The water is not flowing into the Persian Gulf, salt water intrusion. And then they got stuck, as, as you got stuck in California. You cannot tell the Central Valley farmers to stop farming. You cannot tell the Southern Californians to leave Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles dev was developed. It got thirstier and thirstier. We got more water for it. Now, Colorado water, <laughs> Northern California water, we went after desalination. And now we're talking about recycling and reuse of wastewater. All of these are technologies and they can improve your water availability if you only care about water supply. But if you increase water supply, you promote development. If you promote development, you promote population increase, you facilitate an increase in water demand. So you get stuck in a vicious cycle where your hydraulic mission results in your system becoming thirstier and thirstier. And now you have climate change kicking in or you have extreme events, droughts and everything. Then your system goes bankrupt and you cannot satisfy people. The same is happening in California and Iran, but there is a big difference. And that difference is money, money, money. It's something that we don't talk about. Your economic power to cope with a crisis with an extreme event can be different. Some systems collapse when a big change comes, when a big crisis comes, and some system can survive. The systems which have better or more transparent legal systems are generally managing these situations better. So when we have a, a drought, um, everyone will be suffering eventually. All the water right holders would um, suffer eventually. What you have to do is to distribute dissatisfaction fairly. You can do that in systems which are more transparent. And then also you realize there are problems. The cost of political reforms drop when there is an extreme event. You go and try to fix some issues. Like in California, during the previous drought, the governor had a mandate of, for example, measurement and monitoring of groundwater in some regions. And you'd be surprised, like, how come California didn't have that till the 21st century? Iran had it, by the way. And then also putting a mandate on the, the cities in Southern California to reduce water consumption by 25%. So at that time, you could question why you need golf courses every, everywhere, why do you need lawns and everything. So at the time of a big crisis, the system where there is some trust in the system, some public trust, 
you know, there is still conspiracy theories in California. There are people who get mad and everything. But when systems have a better, more transparency and, and more, I think, a better or more democratic legal systems or governance systems, the changes are handled easier. In your published work, you've occasionally expressed a little irritation with putting climate change front and center in these conversations. I get the idea that you feel that Iran's water mismanagement problems are really problems primarily of mismanagement, not of climate change, that even with uh, a reduction in rainfall, even with a drier environment, the country could be doing a lot better with the resources it has, already understanding that they are going to be under severe supply constraints. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, so so let's establish the fact for your audience that I'm not a climate denier, and I, you know, I paid a big price for fighting for the environment and climate change in Iran. I headed Iran's delegation at the COP23 negotiations over climate change, and I want this issue to be addressed. And I've done a lot of climate change research, but we have to understand that narratives cannot be established globally when it comes to problem solving or problem statement. The problem I have with the sort of narrative building that we are doing is that we are sitting in the West and trying to come up with narratives that explain all the problems around the world. My point here is that climate change is one of the many byproducts of unsustainable development. All the other problems we are seeing in Iran in different sectors, in the economic sector, in the education sector, in the health sector, in lots of other things, also byproducts of unsustainable development. Now, climate change can function as a catalyst. So it kicks in, it intensifies the problem, it's, it, it exacerbates the problem. Um, so the house is already on fire and climate change is a fuel added to the fire. Now, would you call climate change a driver of this fire or a catalyst of the fire? There is a big distinction here that we need to understand, both when it comes to problem statement and when it comes to finding um, the solution to the problem. Because if you understand this di distinction, then we realize that there are some other venues or pathways to address the problem. This mentality that, okay, climate change is the cause and they're burning fossil fuels, they're selling oil, so stop selling oil and put solar panels everywhere because you got a lot of sun and the problem would be solved. I argue that if climate change is stopped today, Iran's water problems would not be solved because the system is suffering from serious water management problems. And I make the same argument about California because there are other things that you need to also do locally in other sectors, not only the energy sector, not only about climate change, to address that problem. Decisions that have been made about land use, the decisions that have been made about placing the infrastructure, where to build dams, where to dig wells. So mismanagement is a major factor. Now, if in the West, as a climate scientist, climate activist, journalist, I, I just blame every problem in the Middle East on climate change. You know, the editors might like me, some, some climate funders might like me. I might get good clicks on my story, but I'm not telling the truth. Global warming is literally evaporating what once was the largest lake in the entire Middle East, Lake Ormia in Iran. Around Lake Ormia, you can see the impact of the global climate emergency on the communities here, on the people, their livelihoods, and of course also their future. Because the reality is something else. And by the way, the, the officials of the region would love anyone who does that in the West, because then there's no liability for them. Guess who created climate change? The industrial economies who, who have you know emitted so much greenhouse gas emissions, the United States at the forefront of this. And see, we have so many problems in Iran. Add to that climate change. They took our oil, they emitted the greenhouse gas emissions, and now they are telling us to stop drilling oil. And look at our cumulative emissions since the Industrial Revolution is nothing compared to what the Americans have done and so on. So we have to understand this. If you want the environment to be in a better position, you have to have economy and livelihood in a better position. People's Life quality must be in a, in a better position to think about the environment, to have the bandwidth of thinking about the environment. You won't think about the future if you're suffering today. In his brief tenure in Iran's cabinet, 
Kaveh Madani represented Iran at 2017's UN Climate Change Conference. What did I say? Say climate change is real, you know, do something about it. Our country is a victim. And then what, what do we want? We want this problem to be solved, but we want also the West to, to admit that they are responsible for its creation. We want them to take responsibility for what they have done. And if we want to solve it, we need technology and we need money. So give us those and, and we, we also change our path, our development path, in a way that it doesn't compromise development in our region. Because the people of Iran, the people of Afghanistan, the people of Yemen, the people of Syria, Iraq, elsewhere, deserve to have the same quality of life that the Americans, you know, do. So if you are sitting in the United States, you're, you know, one of the most consumptive nations in the world and are blaming people in the developing world who are suffering from lots of problems for having impact on climate change and you're still buying their oil and blaming them on producing oil, something is, is, is wrong here. Professor, thanks a lot. Thanks for joining us on World Affairs. Thank you for having me. Thank you. That was Ray Suarez talking with Kaveh Madani. He served as Deputy Vice President of Iran from 2017 to 2018. Today, he's a senior fellow at Yale University and a visiting professor at the Imperial College of London.